يفقه قولي وبعد. Okay, so we continue with the journey through the Quran. Down to section five now, which means we are on the fifth tarawih tonight. So that's five nights almost gone. So before you know it, we're going to be discussing the 29th night almost gone. And then we're going to be looking for the moon. So when we have it in front of us now, we need to take the full advantage of it. Because it's going to fly by. And then I'm not going to see the rest of you until, some of you until the following year. So now that you're here, please take full advantage of it. Hussein, take advantage of what you're here. Before you migrate to Glasgow. <laughs> so section 5, Sunan Nisa. Verse 24 till 147. This section continues with Surah Nisa by speaking about marital issues, including the responsibilities of the husband and the wife and how to deal with marital breakdown. So this speaks about all of those issues pertaining to divorce and separation, etc. So this is that Surah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this Surah, He says, Ar-rijalu qawwamuna ala nisa that the men or the caretakers, i.e. the protectors of women. It's not that they are superior than them, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has preferred one over the other in terms of who looks out for the other. Because a woman is not going to protect the husband. Well, in, in this day and age, it's a different case. <laughs> because the women now go gym and the men stay at home. So the women have become stronger than the men. So, you know, we have reports of men being beaten up by their wives now. So when that happens, then we need to still use this surah and the lessons that come from it. But now you switch it around. Instead of taking, okay, now this is what you say to the wife to console her. You say it that this is what you take, say to the husband to console him. But when that happens, you do not mock the husband if he's being, you know, abused by a wife. It may just be that he's worried about his passport getting taken away from him. You never know what else might be happening. It might be that he doesn't want his children to be taken away from him. So he's just, for him, he's just staying quiet. So in that situation, you don't judge people. But here, when they are the protectors, we have the issue of a mahram. Now the mahram is somebody a woman can travel with. And she can be in places with, which normally is not befitting for her to be in those places without her ma mahram. Now the mahram is a guardian, a chaperone, okay? Now a chaperone in and of itself does not necessarily mean a, a mahram. So you might have somebody who is a chaperone, but he's not a mahram. But a mahram can always be a chaperone because a chaperone is somebody who accompanies another individual. So now somebody, like if I'm going somewhere, Nuri can accompany me, he's my chaperone. He's my representative, he's, he's with me, but he's not my mahram, is he? Right? So this is why we need to clear this, because certain people, they try to say that it's okay for you to do quote-unquote halal dating as long as you have a chaperone. No, halal dating is where you have your mahram present. Your mahram present, so you are conversing with the opposite gender, with the intention of marriage, that the mahram is there, is observing what is happening, observing the conversations as well. The chaperone, who is not a mahram, he is irrelevant in this discussion, and it will still make you communicating with that individual unlawful. So when we have the mahram, one of the most important parts is when we refer to travel. A woman is not allowed to travel without a mahram. And all of the ulama, majority of them, apart from the funky new ones who try to you know, reinterpret things to please people and increase donations. But the, the majority, the vast majority, scholarly consensus is that the three day, three nights here is not referring to a three day, three night journey. In, in that sense, it's referring to the distance of travel. For the distance of travel for us is over 57 miles. So a woman cannot travel over 57 miles without a mahram. If she does this, that journey for her is haram. And if she, whatever she is going for, if she's going for something good, then the blessings from that, that journey, what the purpose that she's going for, that will be removed. So she must go there with a mahram. So now, so for example, you know, we, we have sisters, they, they go to university out to the city. So what should be the case for them? 
their mahram, their father, should go and drop them off. And now once he's dropped them off, now they're in a place of temporary residence. They can reside there without any haram. But now when they want to come back, the father or the brother or the uncle, someone trustworthy who's a mahram, would go and now collect her, pick her up to bring her back. But while she's there, as long as she does not travel 57 plus miles anywhere, then she is all good. However, some of the ulama, they go even further. They say in the time of fitna, and let's face it, we are in the time of fitna. If this is not the time of fitna, then na'udhu billah, we don't want to see any other time. Because there's absolute chaos around us right now. Absolute chaos. So they say a 20 mile journey should not be carried out by a woman on her own. But this is something which they put out of caution. Why? Because some harm could come to her and the mahram doesn't even know. We have many examples just recently about a year or so ago, a couple of years ago, I, I don't know how long I've been off Twitter, but I saw it on there. There was a sister, she went out, she didn't tell anybody and then she was walking through the park, someone attacked her, killed her and that was it, Shaheed. Right, a, a Muslim sister. But her family at home, the people didn't know. Men, well, these cowards will think twice before attacking a woman with a hijab if she is with a mahram. They will think twice. But if they see the woman on her own, then bam, they will go and attack. Now, some sisters may be able to defend her themselves, but they need to question now, is it wise for me to engage in this situation? Because what's going to happen? Either you will become successful and leave with your hijab on, or you will be successful and leave with your hijab ripped off, or something worse could happen to you. So in this situation, if you haven't got a mahram with you, somebody to protect you, then in that case, the woman should just walk away. Because what happens? If a dog is there barking at you, you're not going to turn around and stop barking back at the dog, are you? Because you look like a crazy person. So when these dogs, these non-Muslims who try to attack Muslims, if they are barking at you, don't give them the satisfaction of standing there and barking back. Because you're just making a fool out of yourself as well. It will hurt them a lot more if you walk away. And this is what I was mentioning, I don't know what day it was as well, a couple of days ago or something, that it's easy to strike first, strike hard, no mercy. That's very easy, you know, but it's harder to be quiet and just walk away, right? Tolerance for yourself, having mercy for yourself, walking away. This is mercy on yourself. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he speaks about the marital breakdown. And how does he speak about it? When he's speaking about the marital breakdown, he advises about prayer. He starts speaking about prayer in the middle of the verses of divorce. Why is this being done? This is being done to tell the people when something is going bad in your life, turn to your prayer. Your success is in your prayer. People go to counseling, they go see shrinks, they go speak to people, they speak to their friends. You don't need to speak to anybody. You want to speak to somebody? Speak to Allah. Speak to the Creator. That is what the Salah is there for. The, the, the words are what? That if you want to speak to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you stand up in prayer. If you want Allah to speak to you, then you pick up the Mus'haf and you read the Quran. But this is how you get yourself out of this hardship. The Surah then speaks about certain deviant beliefs whilst calling to what is perhaps the central theme of the Surah, which is justice. In light of this, the Surah calls to complete submission to the judgment of the Messenger of Allah Now here, regardless of what happens, regardless of what you think is right, we must submit to the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they know best. Whatever the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam related to us, that is what counts, that is what matters. And when we obey that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says what? He says, whoever has obeyed me, has obeyed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whoever has disobeyed me, has disobeyed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you must submit to the hadith of the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. There then follows a discussion about the rules of warfare, urging the believers not to lag behind, fearful of death, as is the nature of the hypocrites. Now with the hypocrites, they didn't want to go out and fight. They didn't want to go to battle because for them, they were too in love with the dunya. 
And the Messenger of Allah وسلم, gives us a sign of the end times. What is one of the signs of the end times? Is that the, the non-Muslims will come and they will attack the believers. Inviting each of us as you invite each of us to a plate to come and eat from it one by one. The Sahaba asked, Ya Rasulullah, is this because our numbers will be small on that day? The Rasul Wasallam said, no, your numbers will be large, but you will be guilty of wahan. You will be affected with wahan. What is wahan? Wahan is that weakness in your heart, which removes your love for the deen and death and replaces it with love of the dunya. And that is what we are seeing now. This is why Muslims are being attacked left, right and center. Because our leaders, well, they call leaders, they are obsessed with the dunya. That's all they want. They're busy building these skyscrapers to compete with each other. And because of their love for the dunya, they cannot defend the Muslims. Within this discussion, come two verses that speak of particular types of prayer. The traveler's prayer and the prayer of fear, which describes how to pray when facing the enemy on the battlefield. Prayer is not to be abandoned even in the most difficult of circumstances. So regardless of what you are doing, where you are, who is about, you must not let go of your prayer regardless of anything it doesn't matter if you're at work it doesn't matter what your boss says if you need to pray you go and pray if they have an issue with it you leave your job you get a better job you leave it for the sake of Allah Wallah, he, he will replace it with a better job but you do not let go of your salah just to please non-muslims just to please your your belly your desire for wealth the surah then reintroduces the discussion about fairness in dealing with women and about justice generally. The section ends by warning about hypocrites and of sitting with them whilst they mock and ridicule faith. They are described as people who worship lazily and hardly remember Allah. Such a people are condemned to the lowest of hellfire. However, there is hope for all. Even the most worst hypocrite can change and return back to Allah. The last verse of the section poses the essential question to reflect upon. Why would Allah want to punish if there is faith and gratitude? This is why the doors of forgiveness are open until the soul is taken. Sayyidina Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu an, he relates, some prisoners were brought before the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And amongst them was a woman who was nursing, she was giving breast milk to children. Now whenever a child from the prisoners needed milk came forth, she would take the child and she would give them milk, even if they weren't hers. The Prophet ﷺ asked, Do you think this woman would throw her child into the fire? The Sahaba replied, they said, No, not if she was able to stop it. The Rasul ﷺ said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is more merciful to his servants than this mother is to her child. So this is the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We just have to be those people who are actively searching for it, actively trying to attain it, so that we can be of those individuals who are forgiven, especially in this blessed month of Ramadan. That's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow us to be of those who make the month, most of this blessed month and allow us to be of those who attain Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's divine mercy and forgiveness. Wa ma'alina illa balagul mubeen.